Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father and our God, what a joy it is to be in your presence. We thank you, Father, for being such a wonderful God. And we thank you because you've given us your holy word, which is a sure guide in a world that is confused and seems to be going nowhere. We ask, Lord, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Give us clarity of thought and give us willing hearts to receive the word that you have for us today. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. During our last studies together, we've spoken about the identity of Babylon, and then we spoke about the wine of Babylon, and today we are going to speak about the fornication of Babylon. As you remember, in our last lecture, we studied about the identity of Babylon, actually in the last two lectures. And we notice that the harlot of Revelation chapter 17 represents a church, represents a Christian church that has gone astray from Jesus Christ. And according to the Bible, this church has become a harlot. Now today we're going to study about the fornication of this harlot with the kings of the earth. And I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, where this fornication between the harlot, this apostate church, and the kings of the earth is described. It says there, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, who sits on many waters. Now comes the key phrase, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So you'll notice here it says that the kings of the earth have committed fornication with this harlot, which represents an apostate church. Now there's another passage in Revelation which describes this same scene. Revelation chapter 18 and verses 1 to 3. Revelation 18 verses 1 to 3. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine, which we have noticed is false doctrine. We've studied that carefully in Scripture. So it says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich, through the abundance of her luxury. So basically, in these two passages that we began with today, we notice that in the end time, there is going to be a coalition or a union between a harlot church and the kings of the earth. In other words, the church is going to be involved in some manner with the political systems of the world. Now, this would mean then that there are two kingdoms, because there's first of all the church represented by the harlot, and the civil rulers represented by the kings. Now, I want us to notice in Matthew chapter 22, and verses 15 through 21, that Jesus recognized two kingdoms. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 to 21. It says there, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. In other words, you don't make a difference between one human being and another. Now they're really faking, uh, admiring Jesus, as we're going to notice. Verse 17, tell us therefore, what do you think? 
Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That was a difficult question. Because if Jesus answered yes, he was in trouble, and if he answered no, he was in trouble as well. You see, if he answered yes, the Jews would be against him because the Jews did not like paying taxes to the Romans. But if he answered no, then he would be guilty of sedition against the Roman government because Rome demanded that people pay taxes. And so, no matter how he answered, if he answered yes or no, he was going to get into trouble. Verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, which was the main coin at that time. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? In other words, whose picture is on the coin and whose name is on this coin? Verse 21, They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. How many kingdoms did Jesus recognize? He recognized two kingdoms. The first kingdom is the kingdom of Caesar, and the second is the kingdom of God. Two kingdoms. As we began our study this evening, we also noticed two kingdoms. There's the harlot, which represents an apostate church, and there's also the kings of the earth. But I'm going to show you that really the reason why this church became a harlot is because instead of remaining married to Jesus Christ, she entered illicit relationships with the kings of the earth. So Jesus recognized the existence of two kingdoms. But now we need to ask the question, what do we owe to the kingdom of Caesar, which by the way is the civil government, and what do we owe to God? There's something that we owe to Caesar or to the political power, and there's something that we owe to God or to the church. The question is, what do we owe to each? Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13, and take, let's take a close look at this. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13. It's speaking here about the giving of the Ten Commandments, and it says this, So he, that is God, declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. How many tablets of stone were the Ten Commandments written on? Two tablets of stone. Now, let me ask you, could God have written the Ten Commandments on one tablet of stone if he had wanted to? Of course. Could he have written the Ten Commandments on three tablets of stone? Absolutely. Why did he write the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone? Simply, we're going to notice, because the first four commandments have to do with our responsibility towards God. Whereas the last six commandments have to do with our responsibility with our fellow human beings. In other words, the first four commandments point out our duty, our vertical duty with God, and the last six point out our horizontal relationship with our fellow human beings. Now let's notice that. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. It says there, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So you'll notice here a very important declaration by God. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. Now let's go to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Leviticus 19 and verse 18. It says there, speaking about our relationship with our neighbor, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So how many great commandments do we have in the Old Testament? Number one, love supreme for whom? For God. And secondly, loving our what? Our neighbor. Which table of the law describes our love for God? The first four. Which table of the law describes our relationship with our fellow human beings? The last six. Now let's go to what Jesus had to say about this, because Jesus confirms what I'm saying. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Matthew 22, beginning with verse 34. 
But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, by the way, he's not a, a secular lawyer, he is an expert in the writings of Moses, in the law of Moses. So it says, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Did we read that in the Old Testament somewhere? Yes, we read it in Deuteronomy chapter 6, right? So that's the first and great commandment. Notice verse 38. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you'll notice that the law of God was structured in such a way that you have our duty towards God and our duty towards our fellow men. Well, let me ask you, does the civil government have the right to enforce the second table of the law? Does a civil government have a right to punish those individuals who steal? Yes. Does it have the right to punish those individuals who kill? Yes. Does it have a right to punish those who beat up on their parents? Yes. Does it have a right to prosecute those who speak false witness against somebody else and ruins their reputation? Absolutely. In other words, the second table of the law is the realm of the civil government. But the first table of the law, the civil government can have nothing to do with. Because it has to do with our duty and responsibility and worship towards God. In other words, the civil government has been established to preserve the civil order. The first four commandments are off limits for the civil government. Now it's interesting that Jesus Christ, and now we're going to go to speak a little about, about Jesus, because his experience is actually going to be repeated in his people at the end of time. It's interesting that Jesus was never accused by the Jews of breaking the last six commandments of God's law. Jesus was never accused of disobeying the civil laws of Rome. All of the accusations that the Jews launched against Jesus was uh, things, were things that had to do with the first table of the law. You say, where does the Bible say that? Well, go with me to Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Mark 2 verse 7 is describing a paralytic and Jesus says some very controversial uh, things. He says to this man, your sins are forgiven. And notice what his enemy said. Mark 2 verse 7. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Let me ask you, what table of the law does that accusation have to do with? The first table, because they're saying that he's making himself what? God by forgiving sins. Notice John 10 verse 33. At this point, Jesus had said, I and my Father are one. And they understood very well that Jesus was saying that he was one with his Father in a special sense, in the sense that he was God. Notice John 10, 33. The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we do not stone you, because they picked up stones to stone him, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself what? God. There it is again. He's being accused of violating the first table of the law. Notice John chapter 9 and verse 16. John 9 and verse 16. Here he's going to be accused of breaking the Holy Sabbath. Let me ask you, on which table of the law is the Sabbath? It's on the first table of the law. It's a duty that we owe whom? That we owe God. It says in John 9 verse 16, Jesus has healed a blind man. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not what? He does not keep the Sabbath. By the way, were they right or wrong? They were wrong. He did keep the Sabbath. He just didn't keep the Sabbath according to all their rules and regulations. He kept the biblical Sabbath, not the Sabbath of the rabbis. Also, John chapter 5, verse 16 and verse 18, where uh, Jesus has healed a man who was paralyzed, a paralytic, Notice they accused him once again of violating the Sabbath. Verse 16, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. 
Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, at least in their minds, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with whom? Equal with God. See, once again, everything has to do with the first table of the law. One final reference from the Gospels, and there are others, but I've only chosen a few, where Jesus is accused of taking God's name in vain. On which table of the law is that? That's the first table of the law. It's the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Notice John 8 verses 58 and 59. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Who was Jesus claiming to be? Remember at the burning bush, Moses asked, What is your name when I go to Israel? I am that I am has sent me unto you. Did the Jews understand that Jesus was taking the name of God and applying it to himself? They most certainly did, because it says in verse 59, Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So we find in God's holy law two tables. The first table describes our duty towards God. The second table describes our duty towards our fellow men. The first table belongs exclusively to God. In other words, the civil power has nothing to do with the first table. It has much to do with the second table in order to preserve the civil order. Now, do you know that the devil constantly was trying to encourage Jesus to take over the literal political kingdom? But Jesus didn't come for that. In fact, notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. The devil wanted Jesus, instead of being king of the spiritual kingdom, he wanted Jesus to take over the political system, and he wanted him to overthrow the Romans. Notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you fall down and what? Worship me. What was the devil offering Jesus? All the kingdoms of the world. Was this talking about the kingdom of a church, all the spiritual kingdoms of the world? No, it's speaking about taking over the political kingdom, the civil system of the world. By the way, this happened constantly during the ministry of Jesus. Notice John chapter 6 and verse 15. John chapter 6 and verse 15. This is after Jesus fed the 5,000. The people were very impressed. And it says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him what? To make him king. What kind of king? A king of the church or the king of the state? the king of the state, of the political system. What did Jesus do when they wanted to take him by force? He departed again to the mountain by himself alone. By the way, the disciples had this mentality of Jesus also destroying everybody and taking over the kingdom. One time, uh, the, there were some villages of the Samaritans that did not want to allow Jesus to pass through them on his way to Jerusalem. And so his disciples uh, said, uh, you know, two of them anyway, the sons of thunder, they said, uh, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn those people up? And notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, 55 and 56. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Jesus rebuked them for even considering the possibility of using force against those uh, cities or those towns that had refused to allow Jesus to go through them. Do you know why? Because Jesus did not come here to this world to set up a literal political kingdom. Jesus came to this world to build up his spiritual kingdom of the church. You say, why? how do we know that? Go with me to Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Luke 17, 20 and 21. You see, for Jesus, the kingdom is not something that comes with a great show of force. The kingdom is not established by taking over the political system, by taking over the civil power. Jesus was tempted to do that all the time. 
Jesus knew that the kingdom was something that needed to happen inside. Notice Luke 17 verses 20 and 21. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, and of course they, they meant the political civil power, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, that is with a great big outward show, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is what? The kingdom of God is within you. Let me ask you, if you want a, a ball of dough to grow, what do you do? Do you put the leaven inside or do you sprinkle the leaven outside? Of course, you put it inside, and then the, the dough grows from inside out, right? Let me ask you, did Jesus plan to establish his kingdom by force of arms, by taking over the civil power of the world? Absolutely not. He knew that he had to implant his spirit in the hearts of people through the preaching of God's word, and then by implanting the principle of his, of his, principles of his kingdom in the heart, the kingdom would then what? would grow, spiritually speaking. Now I would like us to go to uh, the end of the ministry of Jesus. Go with me to John chapter 11, 47 to 49. We've set the basis now for some very important things that we're going to study regarding the final days of Jesus before his crucifixion. John chapter 11, verses 47 and 49. The Jewish council gathered together because Jesus had resurrected Lazarus and everybody was following Jesus. They were impressed by his teaching. So they said, we have to do something about this man because pretty soon the whole nation is going to be following him. So they gathered in this council, in the Sanhedrin. There were 70 members in the Sanhedrin. And notice how the story develops. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And now notice their fear. Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. What are they saying? They're saying, listen, we have to eliminate public enemy number one, or else the Romans are going to destroy our nation. Our nation is going to cease to exist. Interesting. Did their, nation, did their nation fall? Yes, it fell by what they did. We're going to notice. Verse 49. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, Caiaphas was saying this man needs to die to save the nation. He just didn't understand the sense in which the death of Jesus was going to save the nation. He thought that the nation was going to be saved literally, politically, by destroying Jesus. What he didn't know is that Jesus, by his death, was going to save the human race. How? Spiritually, not politically. Because Jesus came to establish his spiritual kingdom. He did not come to take over the political system of the world. A little bit later on, Peter, actually Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. They came to arrest him. And I want you to notice what Peter did. And remember this because we're going to come back to it in the next three or four lectures. Matthew 26 and verses 50 to 52. Now we're going to talk about the final days of Jesus uh, before his ascension to heaven. Matthew 26, verse 50. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. By the way, this is what Simon Peter, and he wasn't aiming at the ear, he was aiming at the head, but he was a fisherman, not a soldier. And so it says that he cut off his ear. Now notice what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Good, well done, Peter. Defend my kingdom. Use the sword. Kill him. Is that what he said? No. Did he say to the other disciples, you cowards, why don't you join Peter in fighting for my kingdom? No. Notice verse 52. These are the key words I want you to remember. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place. Put your what? Your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish 
by the sword. He who kills with the sword must be what? Must be killed with the sword. Those words are in Revelation 13 verse 10, and we will study them in the next couple of lectures. And so you know what they did with Jesus? They arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then they took him to the Sanhedrin. In other words, he had his religious trial. Notice Matthew chapter 26 and verse 57. Matthew 26 and verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were what? Were assembled. Let me ask you, was his trial a religious trial or was his trial a political trial? His trial, first of all, was a religious trial. And by the way, it was a travesty in justice. Let me mention some of the things that they did which were against Jewish law. Number one, they employed false witnesses. That was forbidden by Jewish law. They had a trial at night. That was forbidden by Jewish law. They slapped Jesus before they pronounced the sentence against him. That was a violation of Jewish law. He had right to counsel. They did not give him the right to counsel. That was a violation of Jewish law. They made him self-incriminate himself. That was a violation of Jewish law. In fact, the trial, according to Jewish law, had to be public, and they made it private. And furthermore, it was forbidden by Jewish law to have any trial or any sentences on Friday, Saturday, or a feast day, and they violated that. In other words, it was a travesty in justice what the Sanhedrin, what the church did when Jesus was taken before the religious leaders. Now let's notice a little bit about this trial. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 59. 26 verse 59. Now the chief priests, by the way, another regulation of the Jews was that they had to have impartial judges. (laughs) Notice what it says here. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it up in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? See, that what they're doing is an inquisition, aren't they? I know you're probably not used to using that word in this context, but they're doing a, a, an inquiry. That's what the word inquisition means. Notice verse 62, And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And when Jesus said those words, immediately they pronounced the death sentence. Let me ask you, who pronounced the death sentence? Was it the civil power or was it the religious power? It was the religious power. The inquisition was made in the church governing body. And the sentence of death was dictated in the church governing body. I want you to remember these details because we're going to come back to them when we talk about the beast. And when we talk about the land beast. Notice what we find in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 66. After they did the inquisition, after they did the inquiry, it says, Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of what? Death. Who pronounced the death sentence? The state or the church? The church pronounced the death sentence. They were the ones who did the inquisition. They were the ones who uh, led Jesus to incriminate himself. But the problem is that the church of that day and age could not execute the death penalty. They pronounced the sentence, but the church as a church could not do it. So what did they do? They took Jesus to the political ruler of Rome. Notice Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 and 2. Matthew 27, 1 and 2. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to whom? 
to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now was Pilate the civil ruler or religious ruler? He was the civil ruler. Could the church execute the death penalty on Jesus without the help of the state? Absolutely not. They needed the help of the civil power. Now when they take him to Jesus, notice John chapter 18 and verse 30. John 18 verse, actually verse 29 and verse 30. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. He's an evildoer. Let me ask you, had he violated any of the civil laws of Rome? He had not violated any of the civil laws of the state. In fact, you know that Pilate had the, the separation of church and state much clearer than even uh, the Jews did. Notice John 18 and verse 31. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. How many laws did Pilate recognize? How many? Two. He says, I got my law, which is the civil code of Rome, but you take this man and you judge him by what? By your law, which is religious law. In other words, Pilate is recognizing that there are how many kingdoms? Two kingdoms. His has a law, which is civil law, and they have a law, which is religious law, because they've accused Jesus of transgressing the first table of the law. But you see, the Jews, they wanted to put him to death, and they needed the help of the state in order to put him to death. This is what the Bible calls fornication. When the church uses the state to slay those who are not in harmony with her teachings... Notice John chapter 18 and verse 31. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone, what? To death. We need your help, Pontius Pilate, to put this man to death. Notice Luke 23 and verse 2. It says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation." and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Let me ask you, was this an accusation that would have raised the, the ears of Pontius Pilate? Oh, absolutely, they say. You, this man wanted to be a king. And he said we're not supposed to pay taxes, which is an open, blatant lie, because we already read that they said, render, Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. He said, pay taxes. So this is an outright lie. And they're saying, this man said that he's a king. But they're twisting his words because Jesus had not said that he was going to be a political king, but he was king of the kingdom of grace, of a religious system. And so Pilate calls Jesus in, and he wants to have an interview with him. He wants to ask him if he's a king. Notice John 18, verse 36. When Pilate says, are you a king? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. How many kingdoms did Jesus recognize? His, and what other one? This world's kingdom. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, in other words, if mine was a political kingdom, what would his servants do? My servants would what? Would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Are you understanding what's happening here? Jesus is recognizing two kingdoms. One is the civil power, and the other is his spiritual kingdom. And he's saying, I came to represent the spiritual kingdom. I did not come to take over the political system. Notice John 18, verse 37. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I'm a king. He says, Yeah, you bet I am. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world. That I should kill everybody with a sword and take over the world. That's not what he says. What kind of kingdom did he come to establish? He says, I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the what? To the truth. That's something spiritual, folks. Everyone who is of the truth hears what? My voice. And by the way, do you know that three times Pontius Pilate goes out and he says to the people, I've examined him. I don't find any crime in this man. Did Pilate understand that Jesus was not saying that he was going to be a king to take over the political system? Did he understand that? Listen, if he didn't understand that, he would have had Jesus killed right there. But he didn't because he knew that Jesus was not a political king like the Jews accused him of being. 
fact three times Pilate said that Jesus was innocent, that he was delivering to death an innocent man. That's a travesty and justice. Notice John chapter 18 verse 38, this is the first time. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. In other words, this man is innocent. Once again in John 19 and verse 4, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. That's twice. Notice John 19 and verse 6. Three is a charm. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Did Pilate openly announce that Jesus was innocent, a violation of any law of Rome, of the civil power? Yes. But the Jews said, this guy violated the first table of the law. By the way, Jesus had not, but they're accusing him of doing that. And they want to use the civil power of Rome to destroy Jesus because of the convictions of his conscience, conscience because of his religious views. In fact, notice John chapter 19 and verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law. It might not be yours, they're saying to Pilate, but we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. And Pilate says, And what does that have to do with me? Making himself like God, that's the first table of the law. Of course, he doesn't say this, but he says, That has to do with you, with the spiritual kingdom, not with me. You know, show me that he killed somebody, or he committed adultery, or he stole, or he dishonored, you know, he dishonored or trampled upon his parents, or that he's guilty of witnessing falsely against people. Give me one of those violations of civil law, but don't come to me and say that he made himself God, because that has to do with your law, it doesn't have to do with mine. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now notice John 19 verse 11. Did Pilate and Jesus both recognize that there are two kingdoms? Absolutely. Notice John 19, 11. Because Pilate says, don't you know that I could release you if I wanted to? Notice, Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless, unless it had been given you from above. Why was, why was Pilate ruling in Rome? Who placed him there? God placed him there. Jesus is saying, you wouldn't have any power unless... God had placed you there. So did Jesus recognize the legitimacy of the civil power? Yes, he did. Did he recognize the legitimacy also of the religious power? He most certainly did. Now why did Pilate deliver an innocent man? John 19 and verse 12 tells us the reason. Actually, there are two reasons. Number one, because he was afraid of the people. And number two, he was afraid of losing his political position. He was afraid that Caesar would remove him. So out of expediency he delivered an innocent man. Notice John 19 verse 12. From then on Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks what? Speaks against Caesar. So what are they saying? They're saying, listen, this man says he is a king, and if you don't do something about it, we're going to tell Caesar, and Caesar is going to remove you from your post. So it was because of fear of losing his political position that he delivered an innocent man. But it was also because the religious leaders pressured the people to ask for the blood of Jesus, and he was afraid of an insurrection and a tumult among the people. Notice Matthew 27 verse 20. Folks, the dangerous figures in this are not the common ordinary church members. The dangerous people here are the religious leaders. Notice Matthew 27 and verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and what? That they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Notice John chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. 
Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king! And now notice this. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Do you know the, what they were doing? They were actually divorcing Jesus Christ as their king. By saying that they had no king but Caesar, they were committing a terrible act of fornication with the king to destroy Jesus Christ. And by the way, lest you wonder about this, did Jesus many times give parables where he spoke about his desire to marry the people in his day, his church? Yes. He called John the Baptist the friend of the bridegroom, the matchmaker, if you please. In fact, he said, how can you cry when the bridegroom is in your midst? He spoke of himself as the bridegroom. He gave the parable of the ten virgins, which is a marriage. He spoke about the king and his servants, Matthew chapter 22. In other words, this was Jesus trying to woo his people and say, I want to have a relationship with you. I, I want to be your husband. I want you to be my wife. And what did they say? They said, we will not have you as king. We have no king but the political system. We have no king but whom? Caesar. They were disowning their relationship with Jesus Christ. They were breaking their relationship. They were basically divorcing Jesus Christ. And by the way, when they did this, this led to national apostasy, which eventually led to national ruin. You see, they thought that by killing Jesus, they were going to save their nation. But by killing Jesus, they brought destruction upon their nation. They caused just the opposite of what they thought they were going to cause. By taking over the political system to destroy Jesus, they brought about what they wanted to prevent. Notice John chapter 19 verses 41 to 44. John 19, 41 to 44. Speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem because the, the Jewish nation had said, we don't want this man. We don't want him to be our husband. We have a king with Caesar. His blood be upon us and upon our children. Notice, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you especially, in this your day, the things that make for your peace... But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. This is the Romans, by the way. The very ones that they said the Romans will take away our nation. The Romans did take away their nation. But because they destroyed Jesus. Verse 43, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. Surround you and close you in on every side. And level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Do you see what happens when the church fornicates with the state? The result, automatic result, is persecution. Sooner or later, when the church abandons its relationship with Jesus, its spiritual mission, and it tries to get the state to do what Jesus should do, that's fornication, and it leads to the downfall of the church. In fact, allow me, in the last few minutes that we have together, to talk to you about the church immediately after the day of Pentecost. By the way, do you know that the Bible says that there are two swords? What's the first sword? The Bible. Notice Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. It says there, the Apostle Paul speaking, Ephesians 6, 17, And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? Which is the Word of God. What is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. Let me ask you, to whom did Jesus give this sword? To the state or to the church? To the church. How does the church use the sword? By preaching, right? If the sword is the Bible, the, how does the church use the sword or the Bible? It uses the sword to preach and to reach people. By the way, did God give the church power to do that? Notice Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be what? 
witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the what? And to the ends of the earth. What mission did Jesus give to the church? He said, go out with your swords, take over the political system, convert, convert the world by force. Is that what he said? No. He said, you, I'm giving you a sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. You go out with the Word of God, preach it, and plant the, the Spirit of Christ where? In the heart. And that way my spiritual kingdom will grow. You know, you never find in the book of Acts which is the history of the earliest church, you'll never find in the book of Acts the disciples taking over the Roman government to fulfill their mission. In fact, what you notice in the book of Acts is that God's followers are constantly being persecuted by Rome. Do you know why they're being persecuted by Rome? Because the Jews instigated the civil powers of Rome to persecute God's people. You see, they continued doing after Jesus died on the cross, they continued doing the same thing all over again throughout the book of Acts. Just read the book of Acts. Look in the concordance for the word Jews. And you find that every time that there's persecution against the church, it's instigated by the Jews. Because they're once again trying to use the civil magistrates, the power of Rome, to snuff out Christianity. In fact, give me, let me give you one example. Acts chapter 12 verses 1 to 3. Acts 12 verses 1 through 3. Speaking about the death of James, it's interesting to see what he was killed with. He wasn't killed with the Bible, by the way. He wasn't killed with the sword of the Spirit. It says there in Acts 12, 1 to 3, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. What did he kill him with? With a sword. Why did he do that? Verse 3, And because he saw that it what? It pleased the Jews. He proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. You see, all throughout the book of Acts, the apostate Jewish church links with the civil government of Rome to try and destroy the church. That is what the Bible calls fornication. That's what har the harlot this apostate church did during the Middle Ages, and that's what this apostate church is going to do in the future, according to Scripture. I want to read Romans 13 and verses 1 through 5. Do you know that there's another sword? There's two swords. The first sword is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and that's used by whom? By the church, right? And how does the church use it? By what? By preaching. But there's another sword. And that sword is the ability that the civil government has to enforce civil order. Not the first table of the law, but civil order. You say, where does the Bible say that there's another kind of sword? Romans 13, verse 1. Speaking about Rome. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Let me ask you, who appointed the civil government? God did. Did Jesus recognize that? He most certainly did. What did he appoint the civil government for? To rule in religious things? No. To re rule in what? In civil matters. To preserve the civil order. Verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, that is the civil government, resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. In other words, if you obey the law, no problem. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister. Notice that it even says that the civil power is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he, that is the civil magistrate, does not bear the what? The sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Who has the other sword? The sword of force, the, sword, the literal sword to preserve the civil order, where you can punish violations of civil law. It's the state that has that sword. So let me ask you, does the church have a sword? Yes. Does the state have a sword? Yes. Where do you have the problem? When the church uses the sword of the state. 
That's what the Bible calls fornication. By the way, lest you wonder whether the civil power has a right to uh, actually legislate the first table of the law, let's continue reading there in verse 6. For because of this you also pay taxes. <laughs> See, because God has placed them there, you pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, notice the word render, just the, one, the word that Jesus used. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes, to whom taxes are due. Customs, to whom customs. Fear, to whom fear. Honor, to whom our honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Which table of the law is this talking about in the context of the civil government? Love your what? your neighbor. And then, if you still don't understand it, verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there's any other commandment, are those all commandments that have to do with the second table of the law? Absolutely. Are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, we should obey the civil law because it's the civil law, but we should also obey the civil law because of love. As Christians we have two motivations. Number one, because the civil law says it. It's not because we're afraid of the civil law, but the real reason is because when you have the law written on the heart you're going to love your neighbor. But notice that the government has to do with the second table of the law and not with the first table of the law. And do you know what? Shortly after the story of the church in the book of Acts, the church took a very bad turn. Apostasy came into the church. We studied this before. And the church merged with the state. And the same scenes that took place in the trial and crucifixion of Jesus were repeated all over again in case after case after case. The church using the civil power to punish dissenters for their beliefs. To punish people whose conscience contradicted what the church was doing. Now I'd like to bring this to a close by saying that Pilate should never have delivered an innocent man. Some people say, well, he was the political ruler, he didn't know any better. He did know better. You say, how do we know that? Matthew 27 and verse 19. Matthew 27, verse 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, that is Pilate, his wife sent to him saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. What was the counsel to the civil ruler? Don't touch him, because he's a just man. He has not violated any of the laws of Rome. And the accusations against him are false. And yet Pilate, because the multitudes were clamoring because the religious leader said, come on, ask Pilate to crucify him. And because he was afraid of losing his political position, he delivered an innocent man. And he feigned like it wasn't his fault by washing his hands. Notice Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Now folks, this is a powerful testimony to the civil rulers of the United States of America. Many times the church wants to get involved in the political process and they want the state to do what the church and the Holy Spirit should do through the Word of God. Many Christians even want to take over the political system. What that does is it corrupts the church and it corrupts the state. When you really stop to think about it. And folks... If this happens, and it's going to happen according to Bible prophecy, the scenes that took place in Pilate's court are going to be repeated all over again. In fact, I'd like to bring this to an end by going to John chapter 16 and verses 1 to 3, 
where Jesus predicted that the same things that would happen to him were going to happen to his followers, to his disciples. It says there in John 16 verses 1 to 3, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Today we call them churches. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Are these scenes going to be repeated all over again? In fact, folks, we're going to find the sad story that they were repeated all during the period that, are, that is known as the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. The identical process that was followed with Jesus was followed by God's professed church during the Middle Ages that had become apostate, that had become a harlot church, and joined with the state, used the civil power to slay the saints of the Most High. The Bible tells us that at the very end of time, this is going to happen again because the last 200 years we've had a moratorium on this type of persecution. And we're going to study the reason why there's been a moratorium during the last, the, that last couple of hundred years. There's a, there's a specific biblical reason and historical reason. But the Bible says that the time will come when these scenes will be repeated again. And so we must let people know. We must let our politicians know that they should not repeat the same mistake that was committed by Pilate because God will not accept any hand washing as an excuse for union of church and state and persecution of those who are followers of Jesus Christ. So it's my prayer that we will share these things and that we will choose to be on God's side and to help his spiritual kingdom to grow.